You could, as Will suggested, rip up your entire recruitment process and start again. Or you could make some of these fairly simple tweaks that are going to make a huge difference um, that Adam mentioned. So, you know, that's really great. Thanks. Thanks for that, Adam. So what we wanted to do was to give you also some examples about how this works in practice, because it's all very well saying the theoretical bit. But actually, I mean, we know that what Toby and Adam talks about works in practice because they work with organisations and see it happen. But we just thought we'd give you a couple of case studies of organisations who've done some really good stuff in this area, so they may give you some ideas for you to take away with as well. I can't remember who was coming first, was it? Is it Nikki? So I'm going to introduce Nikki from Channel 4, and they've done some amazing stuff at, uh, at Channel 4. They're um, long-standing clients of Even Break. We're very proud to be working with them, and they've done some really great stuff. So I'm going to hand you over to Nikki. Do you want the... Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm already thinking about what else we can do, actually, and I think the really powerful thing is hearing from people. So I'm the bad recruiter here today, um, and it's I think we can just always do more. So I'm going to share with you what we've done, particularly in this area, about getting candidates to be more comfortable in disclosing, and also employees to be more comfortable in disclosing. But before I go into that, I'm going to spend one minute of my 10 just to share with you why this area is so important to us at the channel. Um, and it's because it's really been part of our heritage. A lot of people don't know that Channel 4, when we were created in 1982 by the Tory government, we were set up with a very distinct remit to operate with a real clear purpose. And that differentiates us from some of the other broadcasters. Um, so our remit, which is our DNA, was to do all of these things. And 38 years later, that's still our remit. So diversity and celebrating difference and being representative of society is what drives everything from our programming to how we operate as a business. Um, and we're super proud of that remit. It drives all our decisions. And I think we've had a really good track history of showing diversity and disability on screen. But it wasn't until more recent times when we really decided to think about what about Channel 4 staff, what about the partners that we work with, we need to be more inclusive and I guess we'd made a lot of strides on gender and even on ethnicity and disability we did feel that we were lagging behind. Um, when we asked our employees to disclose there was a fairly low level of take up, the percentage of people who consider themselves disabled was, was really quite low. So we in 2015 created our diversity charter which was about setting out some objectives, some quite long term targets to improve representation on screen, off screen and with our independent production partners. And in 2016, it was the Paralympic year, we are the Paralympic broadcaster, so we decided that 2016 would be our year of disability, and that was going to be our pure focus on 2016 in terms of what we did on screen and what we did off screen for Channel 4 staff. And we did a series of things, um, and the Paralympics really gave us a platform, it's something that everybody at the channel gets behind, it's something we're so proud of. So we had a great opportunity to communicate internally why our disability strategy was important and how it linked to what we were talking about on screen. Um, so there's a series of things that we did. Uh, we set up our first ever disability network for Purple. Um, we ring fenced some of our schemes for disabled people only. So we do a scheme every year that helps people get into production. Television production is notoriously underrepresented, particularly with people with disabilities. So we actually ring fence all of those places so that only people with disabilities could apply and go on to be on that scheme. Most of those trainings then went out to Rio and worked actually on the Paralympics that you all saw on your screens, um, which is really, really groundbreaking. But why shouldn't the people behind the scenes be as representative of those people that we're showing on screen? Um, we did a, a lot of great campaigns externally. Um, we became disability confident. We did the business disability standard. Um, and I think it's important to say that in 2016, we did bring in some 
external expertise. So like the expertise you've, you've heard from the other speakers, we felt we needed somebody to help us um, to get to that next level. And a lot of it was about bringing in, you know, some process, looking at recruitment processes, looking at toolkits for managers, encouraging people um, to disclose and have conversations. But probably the most powerful thing that we did to encourage our employees internally to disclose was make a film. So we're a TV channel, so making some form of content that is going to really resonate with people is probably the great thing to do. And what we did, and I, and I will show you the film, and it's from 2016, so it is four years old, but for me it's still incredibly powerful. And I mentioned at the start that we had a really low level of employees disclosing their disability. It was about 2.2%, 2.5% of people who had declared that they had some form of disability, and we use the social model of disability, so it's, um, there are people with visible disabilities and non-visible disabilities. And we created this film in which we asked some of those people, look, would you be part of this? Would your manager be part of this? Um, so that we can then encourage a dialogue at the channel so people feel more comfortable talking about it, supporting their colleagues and sharing if they need some support. Because we knew that there were more employees than 2.5% that had a disability. Um, I was born with a visual impairment and I've never in any job disclosed it, I've kind of just gotten by. Um, so I was classically one of these people who probably had to fudge around certain things because I don't see very well, um, but had never felt, um, I did feel that it might have gone against me, particularly in some, in some recruitment processes. So the film I'm gonna show you now um, was shared at our all staff session, which is where we get everybody together and we talk about things that are really important for the business. And this was really, really important for the business. It was part of our year of disability strategy. So I'm going to just play it because it's much better than me talking about it. In fact, Nina, would you mind just like clicking on that play link for me? Thank you. 2016 is Channel 4's self-designated year of disability. It's the Paralympic year. We are the Paralympic broadcaster. And so there are all sorts of creative ways, hopefully, that we can make a difference. This staircase, I'm not sure I feel too comfortable about going up there. It's just one of those things where TV campaigns and TV trucks aren't designed for people like me in mind. I realised I was not going for certain opportunities in case I'd have to write or, you know, someone would see my pads or I'd be in meetings and I'd kind of write really, really messy just in case if anybody's looking over my shoulder, they can't see that I'm spelling something wrong. Yeah, you're so frightened that people are going to judge you. And I can guarantee you there's a lot more people with depression at work than you think. If someone's reading what I'm trying to say, that worries me. I'm worrying at what they're thinking about. When they're reading my words, it's like, God, is that what he thinks like? It's actually really, really tricky for me to identify people just in passing. So unless you're talking or you make a point of saying hello, and that can on occasion be a little bit isolating. And it is one of those barriers that everybody can help to bring down. We've done a lot of great work with superhumans and, and making disability, normalising it in, in society, but mental health feels like it's still, it's almost like their final taboo. It's actually just saying, should we have a cup of tea, let's have a chat, how are things going? And just doing that as opposed to kind of having that awkward feeling barrier type thing that doesn't really help at all. I learned not to be embarrassed about asking questions. And the more questions you ask, the better. But crucially, remember the answers and you know, you know, you're building a trust, basically, between the two of you. It's really good that I have a manager who will be able to be like, OK, this is what I need you to do. And she doesn't see me as a burden. She doesn't see me as being stupid or lazy or anything like that. She's like, I understand that you have dyslexia and I will do this to help you. And it allows me to just sort of develop and become a better person at my job. <laughs> we know when people send an email out and they say, does anybody have any dietary requirements? It's actually really helpful when people have sent an email that says, does anybody have any access requirements? Because it's much easier to have a conversation if somebody's kind of opened the door a little bit to have that conversation in the first place. 
try and remember what their strengths are and try and like play up to those as much as you can because it's not nice to feel like you're constantly struggling in certain areas. It's nice to sometimes be reminded that you do excel in other areas. You don't just support someone getting the job done. You have to support them mentally, physically, whatever way you need to do it. Talking about it is the first stage. To, you can go to your employee reps, you can go and speak to someone on HR, it's all completely confidential. What I really need from my boss and colleagues is just that sense of treating me like, you know, I'm Andy. I'm not Andy with a disability. I can do the job just as well as anyone else and I, and I want to get to that point where they just don't see the disability, they forget about it. I think if we want to get to this place that is more inclusive, where everybody feels comfortable, all of us kind of need to be prepared to get a little bit uncomfortable along the way. So after that launch, we then asked all of our staff to go back into the database and update uh, their disclosure. And what we found is we had over 11% of our staff had a disability. So there was a significant number who had chosen not to disclose for various reasons who we now knew and we could uh, give them the support that they needed. So I think starting that conversation was probably the best thing we ever did. And there's so, you know, still a very, very long way to go. Um, but we're in another Paralympic year, so we're doing uh, having another refocus. And um, thank you all for being here today and showing an interest in moving this agenda forward, because it's super important. Thank you. <laughs>